Good morning. So let me rewind a second. There we go. So I name, my name is Jay. I have been on the business side of video games now for 20 plus years. Just a real quick background. I spent 10 years as an agent, and so we worked with uh, various studios, anyone who needed contract work or you need to find a publisher, or we worked back then, we worked with publishers as well and did international distribution. I did some of the first deals for companies like Paradox, Starbreeze, Heimamont Studios, People Can Fly. So I've been doing this for a very long time. After that, I spent a couple of years working as biz dev for a developer and biz dev for a publisher until I founded my company. And now we do consulting for developers, publishers, conferences, tech companies, everyone all the way around. And so one of the things that has always comes up from various companies is how do I know I'm finding a good partner? And we're gonna use partner very liberally here. You know, It could be a publisher for your game, it could be an art outsourcing studio. It's anyone that you need to bring in to help on your project, whatever that may be. So, and we've got a lot to go through, so I'm going to go very quickly. But at the end, if you have questions, we're gonna do a little bit of Q&A, and then my cards are up here on the stage. So always, you can feel free to email me and I'll send you the deck or, or answer questions, anything along those lines. So first and foremost, you need to figure out do you really need a partner? And that's especially key today with developers looking for publishers. There are some cases when you do need one, there's some cases where you don't need one, but understanding whether you do or not is the first big step. So we're gonna cover that, how to find a partner, how to qualify that partner, how to structure your agreements, and then how to manage that relationship down the line. So, you know, get in, first one, do you really need a partner? Obviously, understand what you're gonna need. Do you need funding? Do you need support for development, for design, for art? Have a really good idea of what you need when you're going into this. And it sounds very basic, but it's, it's very important because even you know, going back to the developer publisher side, there are a lot, of, we track over 650 publishers. So there are a lot of options out there and each one is going to do different things. So you wanna make sure that Whatever you need, you understand what you need and understand what you don't need. That way you're not building the wrong partnership or overpaying right from the beginning. So, I mean, marketing distribution, that sort of stuff. The easiest way to do this is to identify your pain points and weaknesses. And that doesn't necessarily mean all the stuff that you can't do. So if you're a studio and you don't have an audio specialist online or on the team, then yeah, you're gonna need help with audio, but it also covers things that you don't want to do. And we all do this. I run a small company. I know a lot of you run small companies. When you're the CEO of a small company, you end up doing a whole lot of different things. And being able to step away and just acknowledge, I don't like doing this is a huge step. You know, because if you don't like doing it, chances are you're not gonna do it very well. And then understand your budget and limits. You know, it took about three years with my consulting firm before I stepped away and said, okay, I'm gonna need help. But that didn't mean I went out and you know, hired a six person marketing agency. You, know, it's, you have to fit within your boundaries. So you understand how you, or what you need basically. So how do you get to who the best company is and, and, and what the best options are for you? You need to start very basically. And we use even like an Excel spreadsheet is easy enough to do but start building that list of who you might go to. Work it from there, go through Google. Trade shows are a fantastic option. So when you're here at the, at the Game Developer Conference, you can look and see you know, who the sponsors are, who the speakers are. Look at that, you know, their name, company, and then you can do the rest of the research later. But there's a lot of different ways that we go about you know, finding new companies, and finding new developers, publishers, that sort of thing. We do it with Google searches, trade shows. When you go to like Gamescom or one of the big European conferences or even E3 or GDC out in San Francisco, the German government puts out a book that's like this thick of every game related company in Germany with their executives and, and email addresses, phones, everything. Guides like that are ideal for helping you build that internal database of partners that you can work with. LinkedIn, obviously, and then even just the news. So 
because understanding a lot about developers and publishers and art studios and sound studios is key to what we do as a consulting firm, checking the news every day, looking at Gama Sutra. So we have a whole system set up internally where if I see an article, I can hit a button, it sends it over to somebody on my team, they take a look at it, research it, and put it in the database. You will never do wrong by gathering too much information about your options in the industry, especially for developers. That's the biggest problem that I see in the early stages of them trying to find a publisher. We'll talk to them, and they're like, well, we already shopped our game to everybody. I'm like, well, how many people did you shop it to? Uh, probably 15 or 20. I was like, well, you missed about 150 or 200 other options in there. So it's always good to be constantly gathering that information from sources like this and capturing it somewhere. This is when you have to get past the Excel spreadsheet. So when we start capturing all that information, you know, we put it into a CRM. It's a, I never remember what it stands for, Customer Relationship Management Tool. The one you've probably heard of is Salesforce. For small companies, especially indie devs, Salesforce is, it's like trying to kill a fly with a sledgehammer. It, it, it's way too big, it's way too expensive, and it, it does five million things that you're not gonna need it to do. So when you start getting to the point where you need to get their, their websites and tracking emails and understanding their market and the games that they've gone to and all that sort of stuff, look into a CRM. We use Nutshell internally, but if you Google small business CRM, there's HubSpot has one, uh, Sugar has one, Zoho has one. There's easily two dozen that are, are good options for you. Just make sure you have one before you start doing partner searches because it's gonna keep you far more organized than you, would, you might think. So, you know, we look at companies, we'll go to their website, you know, especially if it's an outsourcing studio, they'll always generally have a deck for you to download so you can get a good idea of what their specialties are, what they're good at, samples, what they're not good at. Capture all of that in your CRM. You can just like link to the, download the uh, spreadsheet and link it to the system and it'll work. Well, I've been doing this since the late 90s. Yeah, we still use phone calls. It's, it's amazing. The and email exchanges, you have to really, really understand who these companies are. When you're talking about a partner for a game, you're talking about working with a, another company for months, if not years. You need to make sure, you know, it, it's a marriage in some sort. You need to make sure that, you know, that person that you're working with and that company you're gonna be working with is a good fit for what you're doing. As you're going through all of this in your CRM, this is a bit when you go back to the spreadsheet because you're going to need a way to easily discern what your best option is. And so we'll sit down, go through the company and say, you know, have a tab for, this is what the cost might be, here are the advantages and disadvantages. CRMs can help you archive some of that information, but for me anyway, it's always easier to just absolutely put it on a spreadsheet so I can look at it all at once. And then we would also do a scoring system. So for example, years ago when we were working with a developer, as a developer, I would be looking at contract work for hire opportunities that came in, companies like Disney and National Geographic and Cartoon Network and, and a lot of big media companies, but we would literally have a, a number scaling system that went for, it covered everything from, is this a good monetary option for us? Is the deal, is the profit on this deal going to be good? Are they a good company to work with in terms of, is this going to increase my reputation or decrease it? Put these things, I mean, think about all the little stuff that goes into these relationships and attach a number to it. It makes it so much easier when you can go down and look and say, okay, score-wise, this company is our best option. You wanna go and follow it up with, you know, the next side of it. All right, so yeah, we're gonna get to the, that's gonna be under the qualifying part. So this is the type of stuff that you put in that spreadsheet, basically. You know, whatever you found in terms of who they've worked with in the past, their track record, their reputation, the profit, all that kind of good stuff. So I, I gave a lecture similar to this like 10 years ago, and I, and I said, okay, so once you found a partner, you have to qualify them. And then I went click and went to the next slide. And someone raised their hand and I was like, well, what do you mean? And it was that moment of realization that we have been doing this so long that we took knowledge for granted. We assumed that people knew things that they don't know. So now we go into much more detail. When you're looking into 
any company to work with, they're going to send you references. Just like, you know, when you're looking for a job or when you're, you know, submitting your company to do some contract work, you send references. Ignore them. They're worthless. When you're going for a job, do you, do you send the potential employer a list of jobs that you have but that didn't go well, that people are going to say bad things about you? No. You send your friends and you send people that you know are going to give you a good report. That's the same thing everybody else does. That's not unusual. It's not unexpected. What you need to do is get below that. You need to, and I'll go back to the publisher side again. Look at the different games that they've, they've you, rather, published. And then go in and find out who the development studio was and who the individuals were. When you're working with any sort of studio, I mean, like art, audio, whatever, you're always going to have a project manager, that primary point of contact that you're responsible for going to. You need to find out what that person has done, what else they've worked on, and then call those people. It's a lot of research. You can't just go in and say, okay, I like the last three games they published, so this is going to be a wonderful relationship. You've got to dig and dig beyond that and get the actual people references and understand, you know, what did other developers think about working with them? Did they handle the marketing correctly? If you're looking at a service studio, did they get the art assets to you on time? How was the, you know, feedback loop when you're dealing with this musician? All of this sort of stuff needs to go in because even if you're dealing with a great company that's going to make your company look better by working with them, if it's a nightmare to work with that company, you don't want to do it in the first place. So once you've got everything set up on, you know, what you need to do and who you're going to work with, inevitably it's going to come to the contract. These are the things that you have to cover minimum. And this is, once again, it goes back to the game and the publisher. You know, what the game is, the languages, the platform, prices, where it's going to be sold, who owns the IP, you know, milestones, and approval processes. No matter who you're working with, whether you're submitting something to them or they're submitting something to you, you have to have a clearly defined approval process. I'm going to send this build to you. You have one week to look at it. Tell me if you approve it or not. If you don't approve it, you have to give me a written explanation of why, and then I have another week to fix it. Otherwise, you will inevitably get into situations where the game is two and three months late because the approval process took too long. And when you're working with an IP, it's doubly true. Because if you send something over to Walt Disney to get you know, cleared for milestone four, chances are your person at Disney has to run it through two or three other people. And if you don't have that clearly defined on a time frame, it's gonna get ugly really quick. You're gonna get behind schedule, they're not gonna be paying you, everything is gonna to start to unwind. The net receipts and, and revenue share trigger, that's mostly appropriate for a publishing deal. You need to know exactly what they're going to take, when they're gonna take it, why they're gonna take it. Because most of your contracts as a developer are gonna boil down to, you get 50% of net revenue. Well, that may be good, that may be bad, depending on what net revenue means. It's typically going to mean platform cost minus taxes, VAT, insurance, that all the technical stuff. What you have to be very careful of is they don't try to put random things or very undefinable things like marketing expenses in there. It's, unless there's a paper trail to it, it's gonna cause problems. So you wanna make sure that that net receipts or exactly when your revenue share kicks in is clearly defined in all of these agreements that you do. Just things to go through while you're looking at, you know, who you're gonna work with and you're doing this contract. Get to know that company. Understand through this research that you've been doing what they're good at, what they're not, and if there's issues that they're weak that you've defined, say, you know, another developer worked with them and said, you know, they were a little slow on getting social media marketing going. Make sure social media marketing is clearly defined in that agreement. You know, that you say, you don't say, well, you as the publisher are going to make sure that you tweet and post to Instagram about our game. It's too vague. There's not, it's not gonna help you. It needs to be clarified and said, you as the publisher are going to send three tweets a week, two Instagram posts, and a weekly newsletter about the game. If you don't define something, it's just, it, it's not gonna get done, basically. Another one, so on the rights that won't get used, you're typically looking at territories. 
So if you're going to sign worldwide rights to a company to do publishing, but they don't do, they don't have any distribution or they don't do publishing in, you know, China or Japan or South America, don't give them those rights. You're giving away free money. Hold those rights. Ask the publisher exactly what languages they're going to publish in, what territories they're going to publish in, and define it as just that. Because in all those territories where they don't do stuff, they're just going to outsource someone to do it. They're going to find a distribution partner. That's going to take more money out of your pocket when you could have gone and found the very same distribution partner yourself. I live in the mountains. It's very cold where I live. And so the last few days have been very much of a of acclimation for me. Um, understand your margins. Identify what's important and what's not important to you. Don't disclose that to your partner. Let's say you're doing a licensing agreement and you're going to put Garfield into a video game and you're doing the, the contract with that company. If you aren't planning to do social media or you know, some of these things that you identified in that first phase of these are your weaknesses or the things that you don't want to do, make sure you're ready for that in the contract. So IPs are a good, re a good example. It's very easy for a movie studio or a television studio to assign social media outpost to their team. Because in their mind, that executive is mine that you're negotiating with, it's not a big deal. I'm gonna tell the social media people to do it. It's not gonna cost much of anything. Whereas if you go in and you say, okay, we're doing you know, a game based on the new Top Gun movie with Tom Cruise, and you want Tom Cruise to actually do audio or a commercial for your game, that's gonna get ridiculously expensive. So they're gonna push back further on that than they are social media. But we all know in the game industry that at the end of the day, TV commercials are good, but they're not the end all be all. They're not gonna fix everything. Social media presence with Instagram and Reddit and Facebook and Twitter and, and everything else is much more important to the day-to-day -day life cycle of keeping that game in everybody's mind. And so that's something that you can push on them and it's not gonna, it doesn't cost them much and they're gonna be more receptive to it. Through the entire process, it's very important that not only you are receptive, I mean responsive, but they are as well. The cardinal rule of any partnership that you do, whether it's for IP or, or music or audio or publishing is the relationship that you have during the contract negotiation is never gonna get better. If they are a pain to deal with and they take two weeks to respond to simple changes to a contract, how long are they gonna to take to respond to your bill that you send in for approval? As you go through this, pay close attention to you know, how that company treats you and other people that you're dealing with. And we have this, you know, very recently I had this situation. We had a client coming in, they wanted to get a license for their game. The company with the license, very unresponsive, very difficult to negotiate with, to be kind, and as the process went on, eventually our client, I mean, and I recommended it as well, we told the IP holder, we're not interested. You know what, we're just gonna go our, our, our separate ways. Because I knew if it's too much to negotiate a very simple agreement with this company, it wasn't gonna go well in terms of a long-term relationship because that relationship right there is never going to get better. It's always gonna deteriorate over time. No one is going to push real hard on a contract and then come back at the approval stage and say, oh yeah, now we're wonderful to work with and now we're gonna turn everything around in 48 hours. It just simply doesn't happen that way. The big thing is, you know, there's the language, don't be mean, be open, be nice. Even if you are contentious and you're angry and everything else, if you come across as polite and professional and, you know, sarcasm doesn't really count because I use that a lot in my negotiations, but just be out forth. I mean, tell them what's going on. Tell them why these points are important to you because they may be pushing back on something and saying, well, it absolutely has to have COPA compliance to protect kids. And we know that's gonna cost you $15,000, but it has to be in there. And you can turn around and say, we're not storing any data. This game isn't even for kids. This is ridiculous. And if we do that, 
It's going to immediately, you know, put the project in the red, and we're not going to be do it, not going to be able to do it, and everyone's going to be worse at the end of the day. This is the time when you're doing these contracts that it's m very important for you to be as honest as possible. The exclusion to that would be like your profit margin. You don't want to go into that much detail, but if there are big issues in the agreement, tell them why, because a lot of times that will solve the problem and they'll say, oh, okay, now I understand, don't worry about it. So once you've got it, you need to understand, this is the long haul part of the relationship. Now that you've, you, you've found the right partner and you've got your deal done, how do you keep everyone happy in the end? One, you need to understand how involved you need to be personally. If it's something that you've built up a good rapport with that company, you may need to be a little more involved, whereas if it's more of a, a traditional just, we're doing this and then we're gonna move forward, if you're bringing in art studios, that's where you can hand it off to your art director or your engineering lead or whatever it may be. But understand how much of this you need to be personally involved in and from my days of producing games and executive producing games, I always want to be at least CC'd on emails because the situation that you don't want to find yourself in that I absolutely hate finding myself in is when my producer comes to me and says, yeah, so we've been arguing with the client for like two months on this and now it's come to a really bad point. Well, I have no idea why you've been arguing and what the issue is. Why didn't you keep me in the loop on this? And it's making everything much more complicated. So either at least get CC'd or BCC'd on some of these relationships if you're not handling it yourself, or have your team, your team lead, give you a weekly just update. Are there any issues? I wanna know about an issue the minute it starts happening. I'm not gonna come into my team and take over and shove them out of the way. You know, I want to empower them to do everything they need to do, but I just want to know what's going on so someone doesn't blindside me with the fact that we haven't been paid in two months. Managing expectations is especially important when you're dealing with IP, because a lot of companies in the licensing world, they still don't deal with a lot of games, and they don't understand how games are made. We had a client, and we were working with a major uh, sports star, and we were doing a city builder based on an initiative that he was doing. We sent over the concept art very early, and she, she just, immediately got angry and furious. She's like, this isn't gonna work, this is horrible. And we're like, what's horrible about it? Well, the colors are wrong. Well, this is concept art. We're not necessarily going to nail the colors of your client when they're not properly defined yet. Don't worry about that. And once we explained it, it got a little better. But you need to always assume that they don't understand. We use the phrase, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. And until you know that they understand all of this, you need to be very clear all the way through the process. Regular meetings, always check in at least once a week. Communication, and we're almost at the end here, that's always key. Explanation of why things are a problem are always key. But you know, at the top there, make sure you're managing the tactical as well as the strategic. So you've got the big picture. You know, we're doing a game with this company, but make sure you understand the tactical side of that as well, and your team's on it. Here's the milestone we're gonna release. This is when we're gonna need all the text approved, this is when the localization is gonna be in. Make sure you have an understanding of that and it's clearly defined, in addition to the fact that now we're doing a game with a major studio and it's going to be wonderful for us. So this is how you do it really quickly. And I'm gonna go through this really quickly because I have a big red sign over here, this is my time's up. Understand the cost benefit. That's not only in money, but that's in brain power and basically spirit as well. If this company is hard to work with, everybody's gonna get demoralized, nobody's gonna to wanna to work with them. Use your true needs. It's not always about the money. Sometimes it's going to be about reputation. Your tasks break down. Use your deliverables to find contract terms. And this is the key part. When you're creating those deliverables for a deal memo or for even in the email, this is what we're gonna do. Use those exact deliverables in the deal memo or the letter of intent and in the contract. It keeps it simple all the way through it. And then use those deal terms and those milestones to define your project pipeline and that way no one is surprised all the way through. The executives know what you're doing because it's still going from the same sheet and the team on the end is no understanding it as well because now you built it out into a plan. And that's it, just a few minutes over. So this is you know, obviously my information. Uh, we've got cards up here. If you want the deck, if you have extra questions, just email me, let me know. Big round of applause to Jay Powell, guys. Uh, first talk of the season, thank you so much.